We're going to continue to talk about the Fourier transform, and in particular, we're going to dig in a little bit on the Fourier transform is this uh, representation of the signal across a continuous representation across frequencies, but in fact, in practice, it tends to have uh, some kind of discrete representation in terms of when you once you decide to compute this thing, there's going to be a finite number of frequencies. And what we want to start thinking about is the connection between this infinite representation and a finite representation and look a little bit more carefully at what a delta function in the frequency looks like uh, and also maybe what it looks like in the time domain and the frequency domain and how these things pair across each other. So let's look at the Fourier transform of signals. And I want to remind you of what the Fourier transform is. Here it is. It's, it's an infinite dimensional uh, representation where we integrate over all of time or all of frequencies to get back and forth between time and frequency representation. So here's what we have. So if I want to first move into the frequency domain, I do this bottom integral here. I take my signal x of t, I multiply it against e to the minus omega t and integrate over all of time. And what this gives me is x of i omega, which is what this signal looks like at a continuum of frequencies that we have. When we did Fourier series representations, we instead we got A of Ks, right? Which were discrete representations of discrete Fourier modes. But in fact, that's what's gonna happen in practice once we discretize. Okay, to get back from the Fourier domain, you multiply this X I omega, that's representation in the Fourier domain by E to the plus I omega T integrate over all frequencies. So this Fourier transform pair which allows us, it's a gateway into this frequency world, and then it allows us to come back through this transformation here, right? So we can move in and out of the Fourier domain very easily at will with this integral transform. Important properties of it is that it's linear, and we're gonna play out a lot of the properties in the next lecture. But what we wanna do is just investigate this a little bit more deeply. So first of all, let's think about what happens with a delta function in the frequency domain. So this is a kick that happens, just like what we have here. So it's two omega times delta omega minus omega naught. So in other words, this kick here, right, is all the, none of the values of the frequency matter except when omega is equal to omega naught. Then this thing becomes height infinity and it's zero everywhere else, but height infinity in such a way that under an integral, the area under the curve is one. So this is the representation of this here in the Fourier domain. There is just kick and omega naught. All of the frequencies do not matter, okay? So one of the questions you could ask is, if this is the representation of something in the Fourier domain, what does that look like in the time domain of interest to me? So I have this kick in frequency, what does it look back, back in the time domain? Well, this is pretty easy to put into one of those in integral representations. In other words, I could say, what does it look like back in the time domain? Well, here's my formula, x of t, right? x of t is equal to this formula here, which has the integration against this delta function. And of course, this delta function, the only time it matters is when omega is equal to omega naught. And we're gonna use the sifting property. So. When omega is equal to omega naught, it's gonna, this is the only value of the integral that matters, and so it's gonna pull out a value of omega naught here in terms of the function it's getting integrated against. I omega naught t is the only thing that matters. This two pi cancels that two pi, and what you end up with is just this. That delta function here in the frequency domain results in this here as my representation of the signal in the time domain, which is just e to the i omega naught t. Okay, so it pulls back a pure tone, an oscillation. Remember, this is cosine omega naught t plus i sine omega naught t. So if you kick the system at a very specific frequency, it's not surprising that it's gonna just generate oscillations only at that frequency back in the time domain. Okay, and so, but this is just formally walking through what this looks like in terms of this Fourier transform or this inverse Fourier transform from frequency domain to time domain, okay? So the importance of that calculation is that any signal 
is a linear superposition of frequencies. One way to think about it is as we go to the discrete case is you could say, well, okay, I can then think about a signal in the Fourier domain as a finite number of signals or an infinite number of signals, okay, that are there, and here it is. So what I'm looking at here is this here. So my fre here's my frequency domain could be just a sum of a bunch of delta functions at different frequencies. In fact, in many ways, this is exactly what a Fourier domain transform is actually gonna do for us. It's gonna represent the signal as a finite number of frequencies, and then what we're gonna do is take these finite number of frequencies bring them back to the inverse Fourier transform. And of course, each one of these delta functions sifts out only the omega naught, only k omega naught here, right? And I'm gonna sum up over these, and each one has strength A of k. And by the way, if you plug in this here into the inverse Fourier transform, what you end up with is exactly our Fourier series representation. So again, this closes the loop on what we had before, which is we had the Fourier transform now, which is this continuous integral, goes from negative infinity to infinity. But if you start thinking about a appro discrete approximation to it, which is a discrete number of kicks, it brings us back into exactly what we had previously, which is our Fourier series representation, which is A of K is the strength of each of the signals at different at K omega naughts, okay? So once you do this finite discretization, you just have Fourier series representation, okay? But what we're going to do is actually the FFT gives you a very fast way to compute all of this in practice. So we're still going to work with the concept of Fourier transform, but you should just keep in mind that it's really just a Fourier series representation with a very fast way of getting the AFK uh, out when we, when we look at the signals. So let's consider specific example. Let's look at a signal that is, we've already looked at this before, which is an on switch. So x of t is one between negative t1 to t1 and zero elsewhere. So it's an on switch and you can actually throw that into the Fourier transform and compute it. And we showed this in the last lecture. This gives you the sync function, which is sine x over x type behavior. And so depending upon what your t1s are, it determines what it's gonna look like here in the Fourier domain. So this is a Fourier transform pair. You put in that signal and you get out this sync function in the Fourier domain. But really this is a continuous version. And what we're really gonna do is represent this here in the Fourier domain as a finite number of spikes. So in other words, if you discretize this into a finite number of points, it might look like something like this. This is my discretization in the frequency domain. It's a finite number of delta functions. And this is actually what we do in practice, right? This idea that we have a continuum of frequencies, it's not really real. What's real is the fact that we're gonna approximate this in a computational scheme by a finite number of points, and this is just one version of this. The more points I use, I could have more delta functions, but each of these delta functions is very easy to compute its inverse Fourier transform, and then to compute out these A of Ks, okay? So that's really the idea behind the fast Fourier transform is that we're gonna be working in this space and if I use more and more Fourier modes, I can potentially resolve this better uh, on the domain and, and get a better representation of it, but it's still gonna be a finite number of points where all I care about is how does each one of these delta functions come back into uh, the time domain, okay? So let's do an example of some very interesting delta function kicks. And uh, you'll see that these are kind of very important for us, uh, these ones that I'm gonna give you ex examples for. So the first one is gonna be the cosine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look in the frequency domain. Here's my frequency domain picture. I'm gonna give you two kicks. One's gonna be at omega naught with strength pi. The other one's gonna be at minus omega naught with strength pi. Okay, so two kicks, they're both plus omega, plus or minus omega naught, strength pi. And what, you, what I just showed you is if I have these two delta functions, if I go back through the inverse Fourier transform, or another way to represent this first before we go back through the transform is just, here's what it looks like in the Fourier domain. It's one delta function and another delta function. So I have to, when I do the inverse Fourier transform, I invert this one and I invert this one, but we've already done the generic case for the inverse Fourier transform. And what this one's gonna pick out, right, is gonna be an e to the i omega uh, naught, e to the i k omega naught, this is e to the minus i 
k omega naught. Those are the only values that matter. And so if you run this through uh, your uh, algorithm, this is what you have here, is that you get this formula here. Notice what we get is e to the i, and by the way, this should not have a k here, so this is k is just one in this case. You get one half e to the i omega naught t plus one half e to the minus omega naught t, and this is just a cosine when you add them together. So these two spikes like this in the Fourier domain, okay, evenly spaced in, in frequency, so omega naught minus omega naught, same height, give you back exactly a cosine, okay? Or another way to say it, the Fourier transform of a cosine is exactly this here, two spikes in the Fourier domain. We can do this also for a sine. So the sine example, instead of the two spikes up, it's one spike is up here with amplitude pi over i, one spike is down with amplitude negative pi over i, and so if we represent this again by two delta functions, one delta function here of strength pi over i, another delta function there of strength negative pi over i, I invert that in, just throw that into my inversion integral for the Fourier transform, and what you get are two pieces of the, the, of the cosine, right? The e to the i omega naught t minus i e minus e to the minus i omega 2 divided by 2i. And so that gives you back sine. So again, another way to say this is if you look at cosines and sines, cosines and sines are just spikes in the Fourier domain. And whatever the frequency of that cosine and sine determine where these sit in the frequency domain, you know, how far out, what that omega naught is and that minus omega naught is. Okay? So that's how you could think about a periodic signal like sine and cosine being represented in the Fourier domain is just through this uh, this here. So it's a very nice pairing between what it looks like in time uh, and frequency. Okay. By the way, I keep mentioning the fast Fourier transform. So let's talk about how to get in and out of the Fourier domain computationally because we're going to now start thinking about this as a number of spikes. And so let me give you a little piece of code here, MATLAB and Python again. So what you're looking at here is the Python code. So I'm going to start off here. And this first piece of code, this n equals 200, is the number of points I'm going to chop up my frequency bins into. Okay, so this is a computation. I get to resolve how, how much do I want my domain resolved and how many points. Okay, and so 200 is what I've picked. So that means there's going to be uh, 200 Fourier modes available to me to represent the signal. I can make it a thousand, I can make it 10. Uh, this is your choice and typically what you want to do is pick enough Fourier modes to resolve a signal nicely for yourself. Okay, I'm also going to make a domain here, np lin space 0 to 2 pi in n points. So I'm going to take up a 2, divided, two pi domain in time and chop it up into 200 points. I'm going to make some generic signal and here it is here, f equals just some, you know, whatever. I made up a signal. You'll see what it looks like in a moment. And I can just FFT it. So I can take this signal, and if I want to move into the Fourier domain, in other words, have it compute this Fourier transform, you could, of course, put this into integral and try to work it out, or you can just do this line of code right here, FFTF, okay? And then I want to plot it by just doing the FFT shift and looking at the absolute value of these Fourier coefficients. In other words, FFT is what the Fourier coefficients are. Okay, and here's a similar MATLAB code. You take 200 points, you do a lin space, you take that same function, you FFT it, and then you shift it and plot its absolute value. So what does that look like? Well, here was what my function was that I just had there. And then if I just FFT it, and then I shift an absolute value, plot it, this is what it looks like in the Fourier domain. So these are the Fourier transform pairs. So, you know, I could probably work out this integral because the function wasn't so hard. However, what I'm showing you is if I take a very complicated signal that I can't just work out closed form expressions for, the FFT just says, just throw in the signal X of T, FFT it, you now have it in the Fourier domain. IFFT brings you back to the time domain. Very simple. The computation is super fast. So uh, when you're an algorithm and you have fast in the title, so you, it's not just called the Fourier transform, it's called the fast Fourier transform, is because it is exceptionally fast to get in and out of the Fourier domain 
And in fact, operation count goes something like n log n, which is about as fast as you can do an operation, uh, a transformation uh, of any kind. Okay, so if you can beat n log n, that, that, that's amazing, but people have a very difficult time beating any kind of computation that can do n log n computations to get you a result. So what we're seeing here then is this idea that we have the ability to go into the Fourier domain, come back out of the Fourier domain. I gave you some examples of that, what sine looks like, cosine look like in the Fourier domain, that in fact, even though we have this Fourier transform, which is an integral over all frequencies continuously, we're going to actually, once we do computation, it's going to be a finite number of frequencies. But I actually know how a single frequency goes through as a delta function, and so I can just sum these up. And that's exactly what the Fourier transform does for you. And it's so easy to use. It's just FFT, IFFT. That gets you into the Fourier domain, gets you back out of the Fourier domain. And so this is one of our workhorse algorithms that we're going to be using in signal processing for almost, not just signal processing, for almost any engineering and physical science application. The Fourier transform is like your most important transform that you'll have available to you. Mm -hmm.